Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is Do Not Fear the Humans' War. Fear their peace. Written for What Am I Doing 170. War has been a constant throughout the galaxy, throughout the millennia. Nations fight empires, resources are taken, and death follows. Getting each other has been a natural part of every species' history. The leaders declare war, the civilians move out, the fighters do what they do, and the winner takes from the loser. This is how everyone evolved on their home world. Pack members caring for and protecting each other. War has looked the same for every sentient species there is. Until the humans. Humans had evolved on a standard world in a yellow star system. They had a moderate strength and speed, ordinary lifespans, and there was never anything remarkable about them. If anything, the only noteworthy point was that their intelligence is the exact average of the galaxy. Oh, when they got FTL technology, they proved to be peaceful and cooperative, unless attacked. We welcomed them to the galactic system and introduced them to new nations, of course, as was standard procedure for all spacefaring species. From there, everybody moved on. Trade deals were made, hyper routes were established, and the humans were integrated into the greater galactic system. The humans became allies with the Nathru and fought in their war, performing admirably, but standardly in it. We should have seen it from here. After the Nathru war was just another page in their history books, the human conflict with the Arthkur escalated. The two nations had been sharing a border for decades, and the peace between them was looking thin. The Arthkur were on par with the humans in basically everything. They were just slightly bigger. And so, when war was declared, we watched with bated breath as to who would come out on top between these equals. The Arthur waited for the civilian planets on the border to return inward. But they didn't. Confused, they tried over and over to contact them. But nothing was heard. At this point, the Arthur became enraged. This had only ever happened one time in all of space warfare. When the Rick tick 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 attacked a non combatant instead of enemy army. When we learned about this, it was the first time in recorded history when every species nation attacked one nation in a united effort. There's a reason why being called a Rick tick is a grave insult. So when the Arkor got no response, they assumed that the humans were the same. We wanted to join them too, but there was no concrete evidence of such a massacre. So we had to stay back until the Arthur could confirm the atrocity. Then came the first day of the battle, and what happened there rewrote war forever. The Arthur civilian population of those border worlds were there, fighting against the Arthur home fleet. The Arthur was so surprised. They completely lost the battle. And we were so baffled that we thought we were getting the reports wrong. No matter how many times we checked and double-checked and rechecked, the readings all pointed to one impossible thing. The civilians were fighting. This, this goes against every law of war known since before we invented language. Every space-faring species in the universe is broken up into three raw pack structure. The leaders look out for the group. They make the big decisions on where to go, what to do, and who to fight. The fighters carry out those orders and fight a hostile predator or enemy fighters. The producers are the largest group which provides the resources for and cares for the whole group. Some species are born into their roles, others are selected or they choose where to go. But in the end, everybody falls in. It's how we survive and became who we are today. Producers don't attack, that's what the fighters are for. When one group loses, the producers are added to the producers' numbers of the winner. 
This has been such a constant that we've been able to make accurate predictions on which species should be able to evolve and grow into a space fairy race. Only a highly cooperative pack species can work together to leave their home planet. The social requirement was only thought to be able to be achieved by the three-role structure. Everybody fights each other until there is only one group left. Then we work together to go into space. Not for the humans, apparently. Humans don't have these roles. No, oh, they have leaders, fighters, and producers. But they don't stay that way. One human can do all of these things at the same time. A single human can farm a piece of land, defend it from others, and be the leader of their group. This isn't them changing roles, which is very, very rare. Rather, that they can move so fluidly between these roles that they have no meaning anymore. This isn't a weird Earth thing. Earth has these kinds of species, like ants. These insects, but with our models, they should have been the ones to get into space not these hairless primates. We just assumed humans were literally like everybody else and didn't look closer. They had a unification war, just like everyone else. How they achieved this, we have no idea. We never questioned where their spike in fighters came from in their last war. We just thought that they were dormant like the Hytians. No, the thing about humans is that you can always be anything you want to be. That is the most terrifying concept that we have ever heard. Before the Arthcore human war, the two species lived with each other in those border worlds. They had formed communities together and filled the Arthcore's lives with new ideas and possibilities. The producer civilians fought. They fought what was once their own group, voluntarily. We confirmed that over and over Every new world the humans took over, some of the civilians joined the fighting force after a time. Needless to say that the Arthcore lost quickly. How could they win when civilians in their worlds far from their fighting joined the humans after a small group of humans had sneaked in? This wasn't just an isolated case with the Arthcore either. When the war was over and we were trying to find out what just happened, the humans were having a time of peace. They were spreading across the galaxy and intermingling with other species. Of course, they got into war years later, and when the leaders of the Killeen gave their orders, the fighters threw down their weapons and refused to fight. It wasn't just a fluke or relegated to civilians. The fighters valued the human peace more than their own species. What will happen to war when the soldiers refuse to kill each other? The safest position for a nation to be in is at war with the humans. When a nation is at war, the roles we have built ourselves upon hold up. There is no danger of mass betrayal, but a nation cannot remain at war forever. And when the humans get their peace, does it start? The humans' ideas, philosophy, and way of life influences the other species over time. And eventually... They will learn the human word, rebellion. Humans have ended our wars with their peace. End of story. Story number two. Troll, written by Battlelox underscore. I sighed. The experiment had failed again. With a muttered curse, I flipped off the device and flopped into a nearby chair to mop for a few minutes. I had to wait regardless. It was not safe to leave the machine alone until the humming stopped, signifying that the machine had totally spun down and was completely stopped. I don't know how long I sat there, going through different scenarios in my head, trying to figure out what the next day's experiments were going to be. I only knew that when I finally brought my attention back to the device, it was still humming. That's odd. I could swear I flipped the switch. I stood and approached the device. Sure enough, I was in the off position. My brow furrowed. I was not in the mood for a total device failure. I just wanted to go home, relax, and forget about work for a bit. Troubleshooting the machine did not have a spot in these plans. I grabbed the power cord and yanked it out of the wall. That, surely, would completely shut down the device, even if it is broken. It couldn't run without a power source. This time, when I sat down to wait for it to completely stop, 
I watched intently for any signs of damage. But after five minutes, it still hadn't stopped. Hmm, I mumbled. Now more intrigued than annoyed, I grabbed a nearby multimeter and started taking some readings. Perhaps a capacitor was still charged, or maybe some connection had shorted and created an unintentional LC circuit. I wrote down the numbers and started to write out some quick equations. The results were completely unintelligible. That's really odd. I wrote some new equations, this time more careful to not use any approximations or assumptions. My brow furrowed down in confusion rather than annoyance. If I'd done my math correctly, the device was generating perpetual energy. What the f- Bang bang! This court is now in session. Would the defendant like to make an opening remarks? Ugh! I blinked. Wait, where am I? What happened to my lamp? My dark, cluttered lab had, without warning, turned into a bright grand courtroom filled with an endless plethora of odd creatures. They were all staring at me. Young man, are you aware of the severity of the charges being brought against you? The judge asked in a severe voice. Charges? Uh, what charges? What did I do? How did I get here? I began to panic. Had I been abducted by aliens? Did aliens exist? Five minutes ago, I would have said no. But the evidence of my own eyes betrayed that belief. The judge sighed and snapped two gangly fingers. A nearby alien brought out a holographic tablet and began to read. The accused, a human from the savage planet Earth, is accused of violating these, the most sacred laws of the universe, the violation of the conservation of energy. Now, the judge said, what do you have to say for yourself? I didn't mean to, I blurted out. I was just trying to fix a photomultiply tube for a small-scale liquid xenon detector when... Enough! You admit to committing this heinous crime? I, I, I don't know, I protested. I mean, the numbers looked good, but uh, it was just a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation. Very well. If you have nothing else to say in your defense, then... Wait a minute. I held up my hands to my head, trying to think as quickly as possible through a rapidly oncoming headache. Uh, uh, do I get a lawyer? The assembly laughed. <laughs> Do you think one of your puny earth lawyers would be able to save you? The judge chuckled crudely. <laughs> I think not. Besides, this trial has already started and earth is many parsecs away. The new information hit me like a ton of bricks, and it almost felt like my mind restarted. Parsecs? I asked. The courtroom laughed again. <laughs> Look at the beauty mind of this weak animal, the judge jested. Poor thing can't even understand proper distance units. Hey, Parsec, ears. It is a unit of distance equal to 3.6 light years derived from the distance it takes for a distant object to experience a parallax of one arc second. I know, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm not even going to ask why. That is that you're apparently using the same arbitrary angle measurements as Earth. No. When I want to know exactly how many parsecs away Earth is, the room fell silent. It is a no matter to you, the judge finally said. Several, a hundred, a thousand, it doesn't matter. So long as you understand that it is more than one. Indeed, uh, what does matter is how I got here, I said. It is a complicated operation beyond your understanding. But suffice to say that we teleported you from Earth to... Uh, ah! Damn! Ha ha! I yelled. You teleported me. Then you have moved me beyond the light cone of Earth, violating the speed of light and the continuity of the universe. I don't see how. The judge tried to protest, but I was gaining steam. You're not here to prosecute me for breaking the laws of physics. You're here to find out how I did it, because you don't know how. You're not guardians of the universe. You're just a bunch of patent trolls. The assembled audience descended into chaos as they yelled, screamed, and jeered at both myself and the judge. It was hard to make out what the uproar was about, but apparently they weren't in on the hustle, and were scandalized to learn that their galactic civilization rested on the backs of frivolous lawsuits. The judge banged his gavel in an attempt to be heard above the noise of the crowd. I could barely make out his words. Gods! Take the human away! Before I could move, a burly pair of aliens beasts grabbed my arms and dragged me out of the courtroom. End of story.
I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Dragzoon WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catal, Lord Ashrakal, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.